Let's let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about um, physical habitat, or I'm sorry, disturbance in temperature. Um, so our first speaker is Dave Guyman from the Yurok tribe, uh, who's going to be talking to us about stream bed and red, red scour. So Dave, uh, you should have the ability to share your. Yeah. Okay, Chris. Um, you're kind of fading in and out. So hopefully I'm, I'm good on my sound. You sound great, Dave. Am I good on my sound? Can yes. You I, I could barely hear somebody saying yes. Okay. Um, all right. Well, so we're going to talk about some modeling, some stream uh, bed disturbance stuff um, in the Trinity, basically worried about uh, risks, risk to red, of red scour, as well as um, beneficial bed disturbance. And uh, for the background on this and, you know, why we're doing this and how this came about and all the context, I'm going to turn this over to Kyle to describe that. Hi, everybody. Good to be with you today. Yeah, as Dave said, we're going to talk about the risk of red scour and um, the benefits of stream bed disturbance uh, on the Trinity River. And this is a topic uh, that's garnered new interest um, related to recent recommendations to change the timing of our scouring flows. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Dave? Okay, did it shift? So, did it switch? It did, thank you. So um, recent literature has identified that the stream bed disturbance can elicit a food web response, and that food rot web response can favor different um, species. And uh, some of those food rub responses can um, favor fish or others can favor um, grazers that might not be accessible to fish and uh, limit the transition of, um, infra of, uh, of uh, resources from secondary to tertiary production. Hey, Dave, we can see in the lower corner um, your presentation mode. OK, sorry, so I'm uh... So I'm going to talk about two studies just to give you a background on that. And uh, one of those took place in the Colorado River and uh, studied a, a dam release flow. And another one took place in the Eel River comparing um, areas with uh, regulated flows versus unregulated flows. And we're particularly interested in this winter time period when historically these scouring flood events would have, would have occurred. Go ahead to the next slide. So um, this Cross and other study from the Colorado looked at a dam release flood that um, occurred, uh, as you can see on the graph on the left, which shows the hydrograph on that river. And uh, they monitored um, secondary production or, or the species that on which trout feed uh, during both before and after that event. And the the, in the middle graph, the bars to the left, the two bars to the left, represent the uh, mass of uh, prey species for trout prior to that flood event. And on the right, uh, that bar graph represents the mass of species uh, that contributed to, to trout biomass um, after that flood event. And on the right, you can see the complex food web interactions that that provided that result. So on the top is prior to the flood event, and you can see those bold black arrows uh, indicating that resources were funneling into um, certain species. And then those species weren't providing a, a super robust transition of, the, of that energy to uh, trout production. But in the lower graph, you can see that the distribution of those resources has changed uh, by the thickness of those black arrows and that the, the, um, by the, the thickness of the gray arrows indicating more resources reaching uh, your tertiary consumer um, and, and facilitating trout production. Next slide. So closer to home on the Eel River, uh, Mary Power and others 
have been studying this type of food web dynamic related to scouring flows. Uh, and they've identified very specific um, changes that occur due to scour. And the graph in the middle here shows a fork right just above algal production that can, where energy can either go to edible grazers or inedible grazers. And on the left here, we have an example of an inedible grazer, which is Descus mecus, uh, the October caddis. Um, and on the right hand side, up in the upper right corner, we have um, beta day mayflies and coronamid larvae, which represent edible graze grazers. So uh, when, when edible grazers receive the flow of energy, that can then be funneled into their vertebrate predator, which is fish. Um, and, on, and on the graph on the right, these show curves of how um, that energy flow is differential uh, dependent on competition. And so the top graph shows uh, resource density. When resources are scarce, uh, inedible grazers have an advantage. And when resources are plentiful, edible grazers um, have an advantage. And then on the bottom, it shows how resources actually get turned into population growth or individuals. And uh, edible grazers tend to invest more energy into population growth, whereas inedible grazers um, have to use some of that energy consumed uh, for these structures that they protect themselves with, like the rock casing that you can see in the lower left uh, for the October caddis. Uh, next slide. So there's other differences that make um, that have effect uh, have impacts on fish production from shifting from edible grazers to inedible grazers. And on the top line, you can see the midge uh, or coronamid life cycle and the mayfly beta day mayfly life cycle. And on the bottom, you can see the caddisfly life cycle. And all these are familiar. All these are similar in that they have an adult phase um, that's very short and where egg deposition happens. And then that most of their life occurs in that benthic stage that's circled in each uh, instance. And you can see that the, the, uh, the coronamids or the midges and the mayflies are actually more vulnerable as prey. Uh, the coronamids live in fine sediments that can be disturbed by changes in flow and they also behaviorally enter the drift, making them a favorite food of trout. And the mayfly is similar in that they, they are active swimmers and enter into the drift behaviorally. behaviorally. But the caddisfly resides in these uh, rock casings or casings made of other material and does not enter the drift voluntarily and is, is not available as forage during this long majority of its life cycle. Uh, and the length of these life cycles differ. On the top, you can see that th those species life cycles are on the order of weeks. And on the bottom, you can see that, that, that the caddisfly life cycle is on the order of years. Um, so next slide. So this, this sets up this question of, um, can we restore uh, this beneficial bed disturbance which shifts species composition to, to benefit fish production while being protective of uh, incubating uh, salmon eggs that are located in reds during the same time of year? And uh, that's what this study set out to do. And I will turn it back over to Dave to let you know how we went about trying to address that. Great, thanks, Kyle. So the um, first thing is just to you know let you know that our study area is uh, the 40 miles of the Trinity River that we're all familiar with uh, from Lewiston to the North Fork. In this case, we we've sliced it up into the maximum fishery flow reaches or uh, river segments. Uh, those are defined you know at uh, the boundaries between those are defined at, at some major tributaries that. Um, you know, kick in a lot of flow potentially in the winter time, and the point of those uh, maximum fishery flow reaches is that they define uh, the 11,000 CFS maximum rod release with 100-year uh, spring tributaries piled on top of that. So the, the largest uh, flows that we could possibly expect to, to see, you know, from uh, rod flow management. So. Um, so data and methods. Uh, the first thing, since we're interested in, in looking at, at salmon reds, is we need to be able to identify locations that salmon, salmon reds are. 
And to do that for this study, we're just using the annual data from the annual red surveys conducted by PRRP partners. Um, we're using the reds mapped in 2012 and 2014. And uh, you know, those years were selected because 2012 had a you know, large number of, of reds, relatively large, and 2014 had a small number. So we're just kind of looking at uh, that range of, uh, you know, density in, in case there's uh, some density uh, differences. <clears throat> the other thing that we really need for this uh, major component is we need to be able to estimate shear stresses as a function of discharge throughout the entire um, 40 miles. And for that, we use the 40 mile SRH2V hydraulic model that Nate Bradley prepared using 2016 topography. Um, that, that model's been used for a lot of things in this, in this program and, and most of you guys are probably familiar with it. Uh, <clears throat> for that model, we used all the model discharges uh, that, that Nate modeled from 4,000 CFS all the way up to 23,200, which is the maximum fishery flow in river segment seven down by the North Fork. <clears throat> so another thing we have to do is take those shear stresses and convert them to dimensionless shear stress. Uh, tau star um, is probably how I'll refer to it mostly in this talk. And that's, that's just basically computed by dividing the shear stress by things like water density and, and uh, you know, specific gravity, uh, weight of the sediment and and the median particle size of the sediment on the stream bed. And that's uh, that's D50. So um, that's what we need for this. Um, D50 or some other central thing like uh, geometric mean size is typically what's used in sediment transport studies. So we have a little bit of a problem. We need to know that. You know, how, how are we gonna estimate D50 throughout this entire uh, 40 miles of river? Well, our, you know, our best solution to this is to use the, the map of uh, 84th percentile particle sizes, D84, uh, that, that were, uh, was developed by Alvarez and others. Um, that map was made in the summer, was, the data was collected in the summer of 2014. Uh, there was a big, you know, pretty big crew out there for quite a long time uh, swimming around in the river, you know, trying to figure out what the D84 was out there. Um, it's an attractive map to use for this because it covers the entire uh, 40 mile study area and it, it extends out to about the 2000 CFS inundation zone. So it covers everything that we would want to cover. But there are some drawbacks. And uh, the, the most, you know, the biggest, most obvious one is that it's a D84 map, not a D50 map. And mobility thresholds are referenced to D50. Typically, um, and there's no standard way to transform the D84 values to D50s. Um, you know how that would that would depend on on the grain size distribution at whatever particular point that you're wanting to do that with. Uh, do that. Um, there's also an additional issue that uh, the way the D84 um, uh, this map was was done. Um, it turns out that the ratio of the D84s in, in that, from that map to what we would you know, uh, find to be the D50 is going to vary according to the particle size, according to the D50, the D84 that's mapped. And it's, so it's not, it's a nonlinear transformation. <clears throat> and so I can talk more about, about that if we need to later, but that's all I'm going to say about it now. Okay, so let's get into results. Uh, we got this spatial distribution of reds is something we maybe would like to look at real quick. Um, on the left, we have the number uh, plotted against river segment. On the right, it's the mean density. Uh, those two graphs look pretty much the same, same idea. The biggest numbers and the biggest densities are in reach one. The smallest uh, density is in, in, uh, in segment five. Um, and then, you know, that, that whole central part of the study area kind of has less density and typically less numbers. And, um, and then it rebounds again, you know, kind of at the downstream end with uh, segments six and seven. <clears throat> and we can also look at the spatial, uh, spatial trends in grain size. Here we've got grain size uh, plotted against river segment. 
the black, solid black is to mean uh, D50s in these different um, river segments. Um, the D84s from the original map are also plotted in red. And, uh, and those dashed or dotted lines are, you know, they kind of outline the, the uncertainty or the, the range with, within those river segments. And you can see, you know, both of these, whether it's D84 or D50, you, you know, they tell the pretty much the same story. Um, the, the bed's coarsest in, uh, in uh, segment five, which where the lowest red density is, um, by the way, and finest in uh, segments one and, and seven. Okay, so now we get kind of into the heart of the results here. Um, we're going to talk about the fraction of the stream bed um, that exceeds certain thresholds of Tau star. Now, um, in sediment se uh, transport studies, um, I mean, th th there, there is some variability, you know, different studies are slightly different, but in general, uh, Tau star 0 0.03 is approximately uh, is often taken as the threshold of, of bed entrainment when particles first start moving on the bed. Likewise, uh, 0 0.06 is often is typically taken as the uh, you know where where full bed mobility begins, where you've got particles all, all the different grain sizes on the stream bed are in motion or with full uh, bed mobility, and then in between those. Um, is, is kind of this zone of uh, partial transport where you have uh, some of the grain sizes uh, are moving and some aren't. Transport rates are range for anywhere from you know low, very low transport rates near um, near the bottom of that range of, of uh, Tau star to um, you know through a whole range of moderate transport rates until you get to 0 0.06 uh, when you know things are really cooking. Now these graphs uh, are showing the fraction of the stream bed, and this on the left side is the stream bed that uh, exceeds these thresholds with uh, 0 0.03 on top and 0 0.06 on the bottom. And on the right, the right uh, column of graphs is the same thing for red location. Now one of the things you might notice right away is that at 4,000 CFS, um, these curves typically are rising pretty steeply. Um, they rise steeply until about 8,500 CFS, and after which they, they tend to sort of flatten out, and and uh, the amount of the stream bed or or the um, or the red locations, the numbers or the proportions uh, increase more slowly, or in some cases decrease. But I'll, I'll touch on that again in a second. Um, so when it comes time to uh, <clears throat> when when we look at 0 0.03. We can see that uh, those curves for the red locations, they often start higher and rise, you know, uh, more steeply and reach higher values at red locations than they do for the stream bed. So really that's indicating that the fish tend to spawn in these areas where, um, where bed entrainment is, is, is more likely than just over the stream bed in general. The opposite is true of 0 0.06. There, the, um, the, the curves for the red locations are, they start out flat and they stay flat and they uh, typically stay fairly low. Um, if you use that dotted line that I put on these graphs for, you know, kind of a, a reference, you can see they stay mostly below that dotted line. Uh, the stream bed, for the stream bed as a whole, um, the, the, the uh, fractions, the uh, exceed 0 0.06 are, are become bigger, bigger than they do for reds. And so overall, the fish are, are spawning in areas that occupy a narrower range of, of uh, Tau star. They seem to, have, you know, um, they don't seem to mind being where the bed does become entrained, um, but they do seem to avoid areas that uh, where full uh, mobility occurs. Now, another thing that you might see on these curves that's kind of interesting is that especially for the red locations, there's some big decreases in the fractions of the uh, red locations that are exceeding some of these larger uh, thresholds. You know, and those arrows point out some of those. And there's, uh, th there's a few places where the stream bed curves kind of go down with increasing discharge, but very, very minimal. 
and I'll, I'll have a little bit more on, the, on these reversals of these slopes in, in a minute. The other thing that you might notice on these graphs is that uh, everything I just said about how reds compare to uh, stream beds uh, doesn't isn't right for segment one. Segment one doesn't flatten out. It's not a low slope. It just it keeps rising at a high slope and actually increases the, the, the slope it's rising at a little bit. Um, all the way, you know, beyond um, 8,500 CFS, all the way through the entire range of discharges that, you, that, that occur in, in segment one. So um, something different is going on in segment one. Okay, so I want to talk about those reversals a little bit. What's special about red locations? Um, you know, shear stresses, you know, they don't always increase with discharge in, in local areas. Um, local decreases can occur because, you know, as stage changes, the locations and just the behaviors of hydraulic controls can change somewhat. And, um, and, and so that the shear stresses actually decrease as discharge goes up. Now, what we're looking at with these graphs is uh, the red bars are, are the fraction of red locations that reach reach a threshold and you can see those thresholds uh, each set of bars is a different one of those three thresholds but the fraction that reaches that threshold and exceeds it and then subsequently drops back below that threshold again as as discharge increases so it reverses that slope of those curves at that for that uh, at that location and uh, the same thing is the gray bars are the same thing for the um, stream bed as a whole and what you can see is, especially down like in segment seven and further down river, the um, the, the the proportion of uh, red locations that reverse and 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 actually decrease in uh, shear stress uh, is can be twice as big as what it is for the for the stream bed as a whole. So um, yeah, the red locations are tend to be in these places where you get these uh, reversals back across these thresholds. And uh, you know, I can show you an example of, of kind of what that looks like. Um, this is uh, this location that we're seeing in these pictures is uh, is uh, right across the river from uh, Steel Bridge Campground, and there's a pretty dense cluster of reds that were mapped in that uh, right anna branch of that split flow around that uh, island there. Um, and you, you know, if you see them on the left, just those white dots on, on that map. Um, but if you, the, what the right image shows is this, it's the same place, same cluster, but it's showing the colors are indicating at what discharge does the first uh, shear stress reversal occur. And uh, yellow is 5,000 CFS. So that's a fairly moderate uh, flood discharge. And, uh, you know, most of the area occupied by that cluster is reversing, actually going to Lower shear stress with increasing discharge. So I want to show me. Whoops, what the heck is that? Oh, somebody. Okay. Anyway, um, it, it's reversing at a fairly moderate discharge. And and uh, elsewhere in this area, away from that cluster, any reversals that occur are happening at much larger discharges or there's no reversals at all. Okay, so now. now also, let's, this same thing can apply to segment one. You can look at the same uh, stuff. And here, this is the hatchery, the Trinity hatchery. I'm sure you all recognize that. And there's just, you know, lots and lots and lots of reds there. Um, this is what's skewing the results for segment one uh, and causing it to behave differently from the other segments. We've got all of these reds sitting there next to the hatchery. The river there has no uh, very little structure, you know, um, topographic structure, uh, channel complexity. Um, and so as a result, there's hardly any shear stress reversals occur in that reach. It just the, um, as discharge increases, the shear stress just keeps going up. And, uh, and you can see that, that's why I only need one picture here because there's not enough colored areas indicating reversals to cover up what's under there. Yeah, and, and we can we can really say that these all these uh, reds aren't here because it's a good place to spawn, right? It's just because this is this is the end of the road. 
Okay, so now let's uh, think a little bit about what were, you know, the beneficial bed disturbance that were, you know, that Kyle's talking about that, that will reset the macroinvertebrate community and, and also uh, risk to uh, reds, scour risk to reds. And when we start talking about these things, we need to talk about cumulative fractions that exceed these, um, these thresholds. Uh, what I showed you before was, you know, how much of the bed or how many, what fraction of reds exceed these thresholds at a given discharge. But now we need to think about complete hydrographs. So um, it could be that, you know, you're on the rising limb and something exceeds, you know, a, a location exceeds a threshold and then the flow continues to go up and then you drop below that threshold again. But for the, for the purposes of estimating risk and, and, and so on, it doesn't matter that it dropped back. And what matters is that, that location experienced that, that, that uh, magnitude of uh, cow scar. So we have to accumulate these things. And what we find out is that the cumulative fractions, uh, for example, for point exceeding 0.03 is gonna exceed the fractions at any single discharge by between about uh, five and 5% uh, and 12 and a half percent. Um, and you know, so that's it. That's accounted for in, in what, what we're going to talk about now. And what you see in the graph here is the fraction of the stream bed that's uh, disturbed. This is the cumulative fraction at these uh, by uh, from a hydrograph that peaks at one of these discharges you see on the on the uh, x-axis. And what we find is that the proportion proportion disturbed ranges from about 26 percent at 4,000 cfs to about 59% of the bed when discharge is um, at the maximum fishery flow throughout the study area. So, and so this is you know, just disturbing the bed to reset that macro invertebrate community. Um, when we wanna talk about red scour, now we're gonna talk about not 0 0.03, we're gonna talk about 0 0.06, because that's, that's what May and others uh, who did some work in the Trinity River uh, back around 2008 and published the uh, published results in, in, in 2009, they found that the risk uh, to scour deeply enough to disturb the reds um, is about 8% when you exceed 0.06 um, dimensionless shear stress. They also found the risk to be about 3% for uh, dimensionless shear stresses in between 0.04 and 0.06. So using those uh, those risks, uh, for, you know, uh, risk numbers um, with our data um, of, of what the uh, dimensionless shear stress is getting to, we, we find that the overall risk ranges from about 0.7% at 4,000 CFS um, to about 2.3% when the discharge is at the maximum fishery flow throughout the whole study, study area. So that's, that's just the risk of, of, of scouring reds and uh, you know, so not, not a not a tremendously. These are not really big numbers. So if we want to talk about management implications, and the management implication that we want to talk about is uh, proposed dam releases. These are the winter flows, the proposed winter flows. Uh, dam releases at 6,500 CFS, when tributary accretions at the confluence of the North Fork are forecast to be between 4,500 CFS and 12,000. CFS during uh, due to winter storm. And uh, the graph that I have here is what it's showing you is the increase, the, fr the increase in, uh, in the fraction of, of uh, reds that might be scoured or at risk of scour or the in increase in the total bed area disturbed. Uh, that's the gray, the gray bars, the red bars are the, are the reds. Um, so, you know, what we, and if you look at the graph, and these are for the different river segments, we find that the increase, increases in the risk of red scour are by a maximum of 1.1%, that little short, you know, reddish bar in, in river segment one, to basically zero increase in, in risk in, in river segment six and seven. So, you know, 1% or less of risk increase uh, due to the winter floods. So, uh, not much. And then we find that increases in the bed area disturbed um, can be 30, it's more than 30% uh, across segments one through four and between four and 19% in segments five through seven. So, you know, 30% more uh, um, beneficial bed scour 
uh, due to those uh, winter flows. So if we get to conclusions on this, um, Cow star increases rapidly throughout the stream channel as discharges increase from 4,000 to about 8,500 CFS. But uh, after that, there's not that much more uh, increase in, in, uh, in the dimensional shear stress in the channel. Uh, reds occupy locations where uh, dimensional shear stress is more likely to remain above uh, 0 0.03 and less than uh, 0 0.06. So in these narrower ranges uh, of uh, of dimensional shear stress are associated with shear stress reversals and moderate flood discharges. Um, these shear stress reversals are mostly absent in the hatchery reach. Um, reds in that area are therefore at higher risk of uh, uh, being scoured if we have a safety of dams, releases, or other large winter flow releases. Um, a flow of 8,500 CFS will disturb about 50% of the bed area throughout the study area. But gains in disturbed area beyond that discharge are, are relatively small. And we also find that the proposed winter flow releases present negligible increases in the risk of uh, red scour averaged over the whole study area. It's about 0.7% if you average it over the whole study area. Um, and these lead to some recommendations. Those uh, recommendations include uh, that we, we recommend that flow releases intended to generate beneficial bed scour I'm getting a phone call. Okay. Uh, that those those uh, should target peaks of 8,500 CFS in river segments downstream from segment one. We recommend uh, that uh, the program develop a comprehensive restoration plan to establish complex channel morphology and promote shear stress reversals in the hatchery reach. We think that winter releases from Lewiston Dam should not exceed 6,500 CFS before the recommended uh, restoration of the hatchery reef is completed. And we, we suggest that future substrate maps should include estimation, estimated B50s because those are what's relevant for um, sediment, sediment mobility and sediment transport uh, investigations. And that's, uh, that sums it up. And, and I guess we're ready, we can take questions now. Yeah, thank you, Dave. That was that was really good. We have a few minutes for questions, so if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll we'll get through them. Uh, I see your hands up, James. Why don't you go ahead first? Oh, hi, Dave. Uh, thanks. Great presentation. Um, what's the downstream boundary of uh, segment one? Uh, that is Rush Creek. Okay, gotcha. Okay, thanks. I, I was just I was trying to visualize that a little better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right, Scott, go ahead. On the Dave, can you go back to the previous slide on your conclusions? I think on the last bullet. Yeah. Um, and maybe I just missed this, um, but that last bullet is looking at um, the red scour average over the study area. Did you also compute this given the higher density of spawning in the particularly in segment one? What that um, risk is from a spawner distribution, not just averaged over the study area. I mean, you're you're kind uh, of implying yeah. That. You know, we, um, that's a good question. No, we we don't we didn't do that. That that's this is kind of a pretty rough. You know, it's just, and I think to get at that would be more. This this would get at that more. You know, to where we, if we look at reach one by itself, we have. You know about a one percent increased risk yeah that's probably more helpful there um because it really gets to your recommendation of of trying to address the shear stress re reversal in segment one and particularly in the hatchery reach because that's where most of the or a lot of spawning occurs yeah you're right and so yeah that 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 average should probably be weighted by where these where the reds are and, mm -hmm. and that number we have on that last uh, last bullet is not. Um, so I think, yeah, right right now maybe maybe we just uh, just say you know just ignore that zero point seven percent and we should probably say it's more like one percent one point one percent. Yeah, and um, since I I don't see any other hands up, just a follow up question: um, Do you have any specific suggestions in segment one, particularly in the hatchery reach, just because there's not a whole lot of space there? 
um, what are you thinking of as far as a, you know, some conceptual ideas for a restoration plan there? You know, I, I don't think, I haven't really, you know, we thought about this, there were some years ago we had, um, there were some ideas about, there was actually a, a, a restoration design started for that reach that got uh, backburnered and tabled because of, uh, for certain reasons. Um, and I think, there's a couple of ways you could go. And I, if I go back here, I, I think that, you know, one would be structures in the channel. Um, and, and I also kind of wonder if there's maybe some room on river uh, right to kind of, I don't know, it's a good question, Scott. Um, I think that's something we need to start thinking about. Yeah, I mean, you could use a little bit of that river right if you wanted to, you know, create some meanders, but they're going to be really subtle. Um, but, you know, it's just a kind of a shoot right now. Um, yeah, right. I'm not sure it's enough increased width to cause that reversal or not, but you could game around with it with the hydraulic model and some coarse designs. Yeah. Does anyone else have any other questions? I don't see any more hands, but. I've got, uh, you know, just thinking about the what Scott and Dave were talking about. It, what about just something so simple at the hatchery is just putting in more boulders there. It seems, I mean, would that be a negative? I mean, right off, I'd say, well, the, yeah, and I, I'm asking the geomorphologist. You know, that that would be my simple thought on creating more reversals, shear reversals there. Yeah, I think something like that. I mean, uh, some kind of structure. I, I don't know. If, um, I mean, we might want to think it out more than just you know yeah. <laughs> putting a bunch of boulders, but sure. you know, a, a, some combination of structures and trying to get more more width out of that right bank, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay, if, if anyone else doesn't have any other questions, um, I guess we can move on to Scott. Thanks again, Dave and Kyle. And uh, Scott, if you can, I, you're co-host, so you should be able to share your screen now. All right, I think I got the right. I need to let go of it. How does that look, Chris? That look that looks great. All right. Um, great. Well, thanks for the opportunity to summarize this. Um, this is mostly a summary of a. Um, I guess not maybe most of it, but 50% at least is a summary of a statistical model. Um, but I also wanted to touch on um, basically the same kind of numerical modeling approach that Dave just presented um, that's a little bit older. And um, I guess a little bit of context here too is that a primary purpose of this um, really started back in the you know 2014-15 era um, when Andreas was um, still at the program to try to give the TMC some, some better tools for um, being more informed on um, potential outcomes of flow recommendations on these, these thresholds. So it's broader than looking specifically at um, like reds like Dave just presented. It's more um, river wide. Um, I know Dave looked at that too. Um, and so to go back in time as I'm um, want to do a little bit of um, historical context. Um, we first started, you know, we're kind of empirical, we took an empirical approach right at the very beginning of the flow study, beginning really initially back in 1989, but um, in more earnest in 1991, where, you know, we found the small number of uh, alluvial features on the study reach, um, there was very few numbers of them, and just we're trying to understand flow thresholds for when these things started to move. And so really beginning in 1991, um, we started using tracer rocks and um, scour cores, and then eventually moved on to scour chains to try to understand 
um, what the mobility thresholds for these um, features were. And then with the Feather Edge projects in 1991 through 93, we kind of changed um, the objective of that monitoring to begin informing the eventual flow study. And so we kind of started doing that in the mid, in the mid 2000s, um, I'm sorry, in the mid 90s. And then after the record of decision started with releases in 2005, six, we really started focusing on evaluating the performance of the record decision flows um, and initially focused on rehabilitation projects. And so those objectives from the flow study, as everybody knows, are to mobilize the uh, bed surface on exposed bars in normal years by roughly 6,000 CFS initiate surface scour on wetter years, um, and then cause deeper scour in, in extremely wet years. And this is all looking at a vertical scour perspective. So kind of a caveat, this isn't looking at um, channel migration or local scour processes. Um, so that's kind of a limitation in this approach. And as I mentioned, we, um, we focused on um, rehabilitation projects because that's where most of the bars were at the time, but um, under the IAP, we switched the um, sampling scheme to um, a GERTS sampling scheme. So we went to the GERTS um, segments and not necessarily focusing on rehab sites. And so obviously a lot of the GERTS sampling locations were at rehab sites that many of them weren't. Um, and we did this consistently from 2009 to 2014. So we have some consistency in how the data was collected. So, um, Back in 2014, 15, Andreas was asking some really good questions, like particularly when, you know, with budget limitations is, do we really need to keep painting a mo and monitoring tracer rocks and scour cores? You know, how much um, empirical data do we need? Can we stop doing this? And so it was a really good question. Um, and really the question is, can we take all this data and develop a predictive tool to estimate bed mobility and scour rather than painting rocks every year? And a couple of the tools that we had available um, at the time were um, using the numerical models that Dave just um, um, gave an overview on, but can we use the 2009 to 2013-14 empirical data as well to um, help do that? So, um, and that these tools, um, and this is at the same time that the decision support system was being developed, um, can we use these tools to get plugged into the DSS um, to again help um, the TMC in their ultimate decision making responsibility? And I'll talk about that a little bit more um, towards the end. So, um, again, the bed mobility and scour objectives from the flow study. Um, are up in here. And the purpose of those were um, primarily at the time was focused on trying to prevent future riparian encroachment of active bars um, to preserve those um, alluvial river um, attributes and form. Um, that would lead to complex channel morphology. Um, it was also intended to um, expose subsurface grains for fine sediment, um, quote unquote flushing and also just disturbing the disturbance regime as Kyle um, discussed earlier. And so kind of our, again, our two tools that we were considering are empirical observations that leads to a, a statistical model. And then the SRH2D hydraulic model that's kind of the numerical model um, is our two tools that we used. So how did we look at this? Um, most of our empirical data really focused on um, active gravel bars. So here's kind of a conceptual illustration of the bars and in different inundation zones. So if we're looking at a point bar, um, the bar flank was really kind of our primary focus for um, preventing detrimental riparian encroachment. And we identified that um, kind of that bar flank as the 450 CFS to probably 1000 CFS inundation zone. And then the bar itself, including to the upper bar is in the 450 to 2000 CFS um, inundation zone. Um, and then our experiments, our empirical experiments often extended down underneath even the 300 CFS elevation and sometimes extended above 2000 CFS inundation zones. We called that the total experiment from an in, um, empirical perspective. So again, that's the empirical data. 
So I'm gonna break this into two parts. One is to go over the statistical modeling approach um, that's in the report that we prepared recently. And again, we wanted to determine if a statistical model can be used to predict bed mobility and scour for the annual spring rod hydrographs. And so we, for this analysis, um, we excluded winter high flow events um, because the duration of those events um, are it's much different than the spring record of decision releases and they're less tied to our management actions. So we were really focusing on the rod flows and our ability to do these controlled releases. And again, the data that we had was from 2009 to 2013. Here's the different year types. Um, we actually had 2014 data as well, but that was a critically dry year and basically is a bunch of zero results. Um, so we had flow ranges from 4,400 up to 11,600 at Lewiston. And we had a large number of sites with bed mobility um, experiment results and bed scour results. So we were pretty data rich um, over that 40 miles. Again, all these sites are with respect to the GERT sampling. So it's consistent in how we did this. Um, so we excluded all the uh, channel rehab site specific um, data that we had collected prior to 2019. So um, for the empirical observations, um, we use tracer rocks data for the bed mobility and for bed scour, we use um, bed uh, scour cores and scour chains. And we would do these experiments on a cross section. And with the GERD sampling, we typically had um, two cross sections on each alluvial feature. And so we would put out tracer rocks indicated here in red at set intervals along the cross section. Um, and the cross sections were monumented so we could exactly relocate them. And then we had a smaller number of scour cores or scour chains. And it just shows how those experiments may have been placed um, in the different inundation zones on that section. So here's just an example of a scour chain showing results of a scour chain um, showing scour depth um, before and after a flow. And then here's an example of tracer rocks, um, you know, before and after a flow. So we would just go out there and find out if the rocks had moved or not. Um, so fairly simple, but certainly repetitive process here. And again, we would document these results for bed mobility and scour um, subdivided in these different inundation zones, as well as the total experiment over the entirety of the, of the site, of the, of the cross section. So we had um, Shay Howland was the statistician that did the statistical analysis for us um, with West Consultants out of Cheyenne, um, Wyoming. And so her approach at doing this um, was we looked at a range of different independent and dependent variables for the statistical analysis. And um, she used a, a whole bunch of different best fit models to look at some of these different variables. Um, so dependent variables, um, we're looking at different uh, ways to look at bed mobility um, in different inundation zones and bed scour and looking at different locations. Um, you know, it could be based on water year types, those sorts of things. So it's kind of the, the fishing expedition of relationships with, um, with different independent and dependent variables. So other um, independent variables that we looked at is daily maximum flows at a site, um, instantaneous peak flows at a site. We looked at shear stress, um, shields parameter, a whole bunch of different things. And based on this, um, the best relationships that we got from the statistical models was looking at daily average flows at a modeling site for our independent variable. And based on her recommendations, we converted the dependent variables to uh, uh, binomial value. Um, where those binomial values were based on whether or not um, the site's inundation zone had greater than 80% bed mobility. So basically what we said is if we have greater than 80% bed mobility within a certain inundation zone and our priority inundation zone um, is in the 450 to 1000 CFS range is kind of the priority to try to keep riparian veg, um, uh, encroachment from happening. If we get 80% bed mobility, then we're, we've achieved that objective. So this may be a little bit subjective, but we felt that 80% bed mobility was um, a good target. 
And then the probability of a site's inundation zone having 1D84 scour is kind of another binomial threshold that we use that um, made it easier for the, the, the linear model to be used. And here's the results of those um, linear models. And this is um, each, this shows right here, the results for 80% of tracer um, bed mobility. And then this is the, the sites with 1D84 or greater scour. On the x-axis is the, um, the daily average flow at the sites. And each of these, um, this is for the total experiment. This is for the 450 to 2000 CFS inundation zone. And then this is kind of the more important one, in our opinion, the 450 to 1000 CFS inundation zone. And so these are kind of hard for like the TMC to um, kind of be able to see what the trade-offs are. Um, so what we ended up doing was converted these, um, these model results to tabular results um, to make it kind of easier to compare trade-offs. So from the statistical model results. So in this case, the table here is um, looking at the, the predicted probability of a, of a site with percent greater than 80% mobility. And for the 450 to 1000 CFS zone for 4,400 CFS, um, it's at about 19%. At 6,000 CFS, it increases to about 30%. 8,500, about 50%. 10,000, about 64%, and so on and so on. And confidence intervals um, for each of those, oops, sorry. And then we did the same thing for bed scour greater than 1D84. So at low flows, you can see that there's basically zero probability, just 3%. Um, 5% at 6,000, and those really don't start picking up until you get in the 10 to 11,000 CFS range. But again, still low, fairly low pro um, probability based on this statistical model. So um, kind of in summary with this, this is an easy way to predict um, bed mobility and scour with confidence intervals based on a lot of empirical data. Um, and at least for the, the short time period afterwards, um, you know, eliminates the need um, theoretically for doing more painted rocks, which was, I think, one of the objectives by the program at the time is to stop painting rocks. So part two was um, looking at some more, uh, you know, with the improvements in 2D models that kind of, and, and the data available to run those that the program was collecting, it opened the door for the ability to do numerical modeling. And so we used uh, basically an identical or very similar approach to what um, David presented earlier using the 2D model to predict boundary shear stress. And again, the same force balance equations that Dave showed and similar assumptions about um, bed mobility thresholds um, of mobility when the ratio of the mobility force, the resistance force greater than one, and then you know more sub substantial bed scour as that ratio increases to like two. So one of the, um, and, and so these are some assumptions that we can um, actually do some validation on. I'll talk about a little bit later. But to run this, we need um, you know, shear stress and we need grain size and an assumption of shields parameter to do this. So the computational process that we use, again, identical to what Dave used, we used the SRH2D model from uh, Nate Bradley in 2016. Um, we used the substrate D84 map that um, was in Alvarez at all 2015. And then we superimposed on that the active bar map. So this is kind of focused on active bars that were mapped in 2014 um, in the upper 40 miles of the river. Um, a little bit of, um, I guess, our bias um, we've always used, and this is something I think that we kind of need to work through. Um, we prefer using the D84 instead of the D50 because for disturbance regimes, for um, bar scour and riparian seedling scour, and probably even just disturbance for um, benthic macroinvertebrates like Kyle talked about, Conceptually, we like the idea of if we can mobilize the framework particle of a bar, which we define as like a D84 size, if we can mobilize the skeleton of the bar, we can better say that the bar is mobilized. And sometimes we see the D50 grains moving across the static D84 surface. 
So it's kind of a nuance, um, but um, it's probably something that we should try to work through. But so in our case, um, the Alvarez at all maps were great um, and because they were based on D84. And so we overlay all this information, um, spatially explicit 2D modeling uh, for boundary shear stress. We have spatially explicit D84 and active bar maps to do the analysis to create, compute boundary shear stress. And then with the uh, um, shields parameter, we can compute whether the, the bed is mobilized um, based on assumptions of, of shields parameter. So again, we use the, um, uh, for we needed hydrology for that, so we chose. Um, and again, the purpose of this was primarily to help inform the TMC on trade offs for annual flow recommendations. And we would be doing this um, in coordination with Todd primarily to run different flows from the SRH 2D model that the um, flow work group was considering and use that to predict um, bed mobility. Um, Within the upper 40 miles. So in this case, you know, we we're comparing 6,000 CFS and 8,500. And for the analysis that we did, we did not um, factor in tributary accretion at the time, or you know, maximum probable flood. But that's something that could be added. Again, overlaying the um, the D84 maps, which shows the fancy colors here from Alvarez et al. Um, with the active bar boundaries to be spatially, and then the, the shield stress predictions from the SRH2D, we could compute bed mobility anywhere we wanted to within that active bar area. And this is kind of showing the results of that um, in the orange shading here for 6,000 CFS for a D84 shields printer of 0.02, um, and then 8,500 as well. So you can see that that area of potential bed mobility increases um, with increased flow. And then we would tabulate that information um, and send that to the flow work group. And so this is, again, just a comparison of 6,000 CFS versus 8,500. So this first column here looks at um, the area of active bar mobilized by 6,000 CFS, and then the percentage of the total active bar um, in the project reach. And then we can compare that to 8,500. And because the objective of 6,000 CFS is just to mobilize um, the bed surface or the bar surfaces, that's why this is highlighted because that's an objective of a normal year. And then these other columns here are looking at kind of shallow scour and the green is highlighted here because that's what the objective is from the flow study from 8,500 is to, to cause um, greater than 1D84 scour. And so you can look at the differences in predicted um, mobility thresholds um, between 6,000 and 8,500 as well as bar scour of 1D84. And we can start summarizing what those trade-offs are. So in this case, um, for 6,000 CFS, the bed mobility thresholds are probably partially met because we're only getting about 50%. And for 8,500, we're not really meeting um, with only 27% of the um, active bar area scoured. We're pretty low on that. So we're probably not meeting that. We can also look at how the bed mobilization changes between um, different flows. So like between 6,000 and 8,500, we increase that by 25%. Um, and same thing with shallow scour, we get a bigger increase in the percentage, about 56% between these two flows, but overall the percentage is still pretty low at 27%. Um, and then same thing with deeper scour at 8,500. Um, you know, we get a 70% increase, but it's still only 17% total. Um, but this, again, at 8,500, this isn't one of our, one of the flow study objectives for an extremely wet year, for example. Um, some of the shields parameter values um, probably need some more discussion amongst the physical work group if we're going to use this kind of approach. Um, you know, one is using D84 and then kind of getting some better agreement on which values that we're using. So that may be a to-do list for us if we want to use these um, in the future. So kind of a wrap up um, for the empirical model summary. Um, you know, we had a lot of data to use. It's about out, it's a bit outdated. Um, the confidence intervals were fairly wide. 
Um, so there's some uncertainty there, but it's fairly easy to use. Um, but because it's kind of outdated, um, you know, we kind of need to caveat use of those predictions that this is based on empirical observations from 2009 and 2013. So the river's changed a fair amount out there. Um, so, um, but we can still probably use the empirical data or predictions as a no cost supplement to um, numerical modeling results if we end up using that in the future. So um, it's maybe worth just checking in and um, including those results as we do this in the future. Um, one other thing that we contemplated doing, we just didn't have the time and budget to do this, is the large amount of bed mobility and scour data that we have um, and kind of the overlap with the D84 mapping from Alvarez et al. 2015 and our empirical measurements is that we can do some calibration and validation of the shields parameter values um, spatially explicit um, to have a better, um, I guess, basis for some of the um, shields parameter values that we're using. So we're pretty data rich there. Um, so that would actually be a pretty fun task if um, Dave was interested and, and others are working on working on this. Um, seems like we could make good use of that existing data. Um, the original question that um, Andreas and other TRP staff are pose, posing to us, you know, can we use a statistical model or numerical model to address these rather than painting rocks? I think the answer is yes. Um, my opinion now is that the numerical modeling is probably a much better approach, um, provided that we have the data to feed that model. Um, I guess my one caveat to that would just be, I think that it's still useful to do some validation and it doesn't have to be as extensive as all the rocks that were painted um, back in the day, but some validation of model results would probably be useful just so we don't kind of blindly um, embrace the model results as reality. Um, and it would be nice if the decision support system was still um, going to be used to add this to the, the DSS. Um, summary on the numerical model results. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I tend to think that this is a much better approach provided that we have the data to, to feed the beast. But it sounds like with the, um, the funding coming along in 2022, that the grain size mapping will be redone. Um, and so this can be redone, which is fairly exciting. Um, I would encourage the gravel mappers um, to include the D84 um, and maybe the D50, because there are relationships. If we have both the 84 and D50, we can actually use a bed mobility model um, to predict uh, critical shields parameter for any grain size that we want, whether it's D84, D50. So it gives us a little bit more flexibility there. Um, and the numerical model gives us more flexibility than the empirical statistical model, because we can look at different water year types. We can look at accretion values. Um, we can look at different uh, peak flow alternatives. Um, and we can do sensitivity analyses on shields parameter as well. So, um, and it's really, quick and easy to do um, once we have the information. We can look at different reaches, different geomorphic features, different inundation zones. Um, we can look at mesohabitat. We can look at red areas that Dave and Kyle talked about um, before. We can focus on re riparian revegetation patches where seedlings are initiating. So it just gives us a lot more power to be more focused on what analyses that we may do. Um, and again, it can support decision support system if we choose to incorporate it into that. Um, so that's it. Um, any questions, discussion? Thanks, Scott. Um, does anyone have any questions for Scott? Okay, I'll ask one. Thanks, Dave. Because Tom, I'm, I'm wondering what, if it, when you're using D84 for your mobility stuff, 
I mean, what are you defining to be your, um, like your threshold values? 0.02. So um, we've relied a lot on some of Parker's relationships and Ned Andrews' work um, that, you know, like on Sage Hen Creek and, and some others um, that kind of indicate that we reach kind of an asymptotic value as grain size gets to D84 and, and larger grain sizes that it kind of flattens out at 0.02 values. So we've been using that and it's been supported by um, our you know, 1990s and 2000s tracer rock um, uh, kind of validation calculations. But that's again where, you know, with the tracer rocks that we have out there because we placed D84 and D50, we can actually go back um, and do a pretty robust comparison and do our own evaluation of which one may work better. So I think it would be a pretty exciting analysis to do um, if folks are interested in that, to kind of take a, a closer look at these values. Thank you. I see Kyle has his hand up. Why don't you go ahead, Kyle? Yeah, I guess I, guess I was just going to follow up on that with Dave and Scott. And um, we had these different thresholds uh, in in the work we did for full bed mobility and, and partial bed mobility. I, I, just, I guess I just wanted to see if maybe there were um, different uses for, like if D84 entrainment was best for riparian or and possibly red, um scour and d50 might be more indicative of kind of this surface disturbance of of bugs is there um any way or any literature that would guide us to which grain size and and uh shields thresholds would be most appropriate for different uses yeah, potentially. Um, I have not looked into the literature in a while on this, but it may be worth, um, you know, looking at Mary's paper and, and maybe even just talking to her if she has an opinion on that, because I could see, like, like you mentioned, from a bug perspective that, you know, I guess in the worst case scenario where you have a, a D50 that's mobilizing on top of a largely static D84 grain size, that's probably still fine for achieving um, kind of that disturbance function for bugs, but like you said, you know, for riparian or, or red scour, it may not be. But this has been something that um, I guess it's just been one of those, um, maybe it's a, it's a detail, it probably certainly looks like a detail to non-geomorphologists, but it's something that's, um, we should probably try to um, refine just, it's kind of like our geomorphic reach maps, like everyone's got a little bit different method for it. I don't think it would probably take too hard to too much work to try to kind of come together on some consistency on these values and kind of rationale. Probably be worth doing. Okay, does anyone else have any other Final thoughts for Scott before we move on. Okay, well, thanks a lot again, Scott. I think you're, I think that, is that it for you? Yeah, I think I'm off the hook from now. Yeah, I think you're off the hook now. Okay, well, hopefully you can join us for the future ones. Um, let's go ahead and move on to Seth and Kyle, who's going to be presenting about the flow synthesis. And um, we actually have to, um, adjourn it right at about three because uh, RCD needs the Zoom for another meeting. So keep that in mind in your presentation. And I'll send you messages, um, Seth and Kyle, as we get, we're getting close to time. So the, the floor is yours. All right. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you fine. And you should have the ability to share your screen. Yeah, so. well, I was just thinking when you were saying that. Um, the RCD needs the line at three. I just if I just talk straight until three, then no one would have any time to ask me any questions. How's that? 
That's what's happened the last few weeks, unfortunately. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, okay, share my screen here. <clears throat> well, again, I think I'm on the uh, the web browser version here, so I don't actually see what you're seeing. We see your uh, open. Yeah, I'm trying to go into presentation mode here. And I don't know why it won't let me. Do you, uh, do you see the presentation, just not in presentation mode? Yeah. Um, why? Slideshow. Why else? Not a, go and do that. Hmm. I might do something else. Uh, oh, whoops, that's because it all came up on my other screen over here. Um, let's see, let me do this. It's weird, it's opened, it opened up the uh, slideshow version on my other screen. There we okay. go. How's that look? That looks way better. Okay. Um, well, thanks uh, everyone for sticking on the call. We're ready to cram uh, some more information in your brain from those uh, very meaty uh, subjects that Dave uh, Guyman and others and Scott McBain and others presented to you. So hopefully there's something left in the tank <laughs> for you uh, in your mind for uh, a little something else. Um, temperature, Tree River temperatures. Um, I do first, I definitely would like to um, note that um, there is a lot of heavy, the, the um, gonna give you a summary of the temperature synthesis report today, which some of you may have seen um, on uh, previous, T maybe last month or last uh, TMC call in September, I think. Um, you know, first I'd like to um, just say that uh, Eli Asarian is the uh, primary author here who did a lot of the heavy lifting, vast majority of the heavy lifting. And then um, also Kyle DiGiulio and Dave Guyman uh, from the Yurok tribe contributed heavily to this uh, product, as well as Todd Buxton from uh, Reclamation. So um, it's a lot, of, a lot of work here and a really good uh, team to work with. Um, let's see, the, the report is uh, still in peer review, but should be uh, expected to be um, finalized in coming months. Um, I would just say, you know, for the time being, for, you know, after today's call, uh, you know, we don't really expect a lot of changes to the document or a ton of substantive changes to the document, but it is, uh, has not completed peer review, so we do consider it uh, still provisional. Um, some of the report objectives were to, you know, construct a very large database um, of all water temperature data, uh, water temperature data available in the basin for which there's, you'll see it's quite a large volume as you can imagine. I mean, everything from small little data saunders, you know, to uh, dam flows, uh, temperature, um, you know, uh, thermometers and stuff in dams to, um, just about every every uh, everything you can imagine all throughout the basin from tributaries and main stem. Um, evaluate the patterns in that data and then evaluate also how the rod flows. 
um, have affected, you know, main stem temperatures and temperature compliance, and then build and update our conceptual models of water temperature and their effects on uh, biota and organisms in the river, and then develop management recommendations. Uh, it's a pretty meaty document, a couple hundred pages, uh, you know, dozens, maybe actually hundreds of reports and stuff reviewed. And um, some of those data sets, you know, pretty long term data sets over 100 years. And um, Eli just corrected me um, this morning because this last bullet in a previous version said hundreds of thousands of. Uh, individual data points analyzed and he sent me an email he said hey change that to millions so uh, millions of individual uh, data records analyzed um, in terms of the methods we separated time periods into four different time periods pre-dam full diversion the transitional period and then the rod era as you can see there gathered data sets from just about every um, Entity, tribe, agency um, that you you know could could imagine that's operating in the basin, and then you know applied uh, various statistical models. A lot of those have uh, been uh, discussed on this call already today, like SRHTD, RBM10. Um, Eli did quite a lot of work, like filling in gaps, um, and then also um, testing the data for sen sensitivity analysis and testing the data, leave one out, leave one out, leave one in uh, analyses, um, and uh, various uh, climate change models as well. Um, get into some, uh, some more detail on that here. You know, this is just a graphic that was put together to show um, kind of <laughs> the years and locations, time periods for particular locations where data came from, just to give you an idea of the uh, breadth of this uh, uh, of this endeavor, also where the source of that data. Uh, so as you can imagine, Pretty in pretty in detail. Um, this is just a broad look at monthly flows uh, in the Trinity River. I think you know a lot of you are pretty familiar with the effects of the Trinity River uh, division of the Central Valley Project on flows. You know historically we had highest flows in um, you know in the winter and spring uh, months and um, that got really muted out in the transitional area and the full diversion era and then with the um, with the rod flows you know uh, the flows in the spring were somewhat replaced uh, or um, you know, beefed up, but, you know, still in this area, there's still a large difference, obviously, in the winter when uh, water is being stored in Trinity Reservoir. Large difference between the pre-dam era and today. I'll be getting that. Um, you know, this is just uh, like a, a look at the, the top graph is, um, like a cross validation for the leave one out analyses that uh, I don't know if Eli is on the call or if Kyle or anyone want to speak to this. Um, but it, it just sh it just shows uh, basically um, how the methods were used to basically um, develop not only kind of the sensitivity analysis, um, but also, um, you know, how well the models themselves were working. The bottom graph is um, uh, essentially the top is air temperature. And I don't, can you guys read everything pretty well? Top is air temperature, the middle is um, wa water temperature, 
and then the bottom is mean daily flow and the um, dash line is the is the model flows and the uh, and the uh, the actual the thin line you see there are the actuals. And hey Seth, I, I can just add here yeah, that you think, uh, er, early on in the in the process it became really apparent that this unimpaired flow record was going to be very important to a lot of the analysis that we wanted to be, do and. Um, Eli put a, put a lot of really good work into, into using these models to generate a, a very good unimpaired flow record for the entire time period since the dam went in. And, and he not only did flows, but he did temperatures. So we have an unimpaired flow and temperature record for, uh, for Lewiston had the Trinity River Division not been constructed. And you can see the. Uh, I, I, I am here if anyone has any questions. So, oh, okay. We must ask. <laughs> Thanks, Eli. And you can see here this red line here are the model temperatures with the, the shaded gray, the actuals, and you can kind of see the model fit um, in that uh, graphic. So, this is the. Um, um, the top is the modeled no dams uh, water temperatures that's in degrees uh, uh, Celsius. Um, and the middle is the measured with dams and the bottom is a difference between the two. So, you know, I think, uh, again, a lot of you are familiar with these kind of broad concepts that there is a peak of, uh, you know, thermal heating in the Trinity River in you know July and August dropping off into the fall and um, that with dams at Lewiston that has been obviously very um, muted if you will there's really not that uh, you know pattern that we see in the historical record seasonal pattern that's in the historical record and then the largest difference we see between the pre-dam and the post-dam era is in July and August when, uh, you know, there's quite a big uh, difference, 10, 12 degrees Celsius in the summer months from the historical, um, historical river temperatures. So there's some really interesting um, slides coming up that I think really um, there's another one of my favorites coming up that really show the um, not only the effect that the dams have had overall, but then also what the rod, the results of the rod have been to the rod, uh, spring rod flow releases to water temperatures. If you look right here where the arrow is pointing, um, you can see, like, if you notice the 1978 to 1989 era in these two graphs, this is Pear Tree and Douglas City here. Um, and hopefully, you guys can see my cursor okay. Um, the rod flows, because of our large uh, flow releases, and or I shouldn't say large, are relative to the entire, you know, base flows in the entire year, the relatively large flow releases uh, from Lewiston Dam um, have resulted in this kink. So normally we'd have this uh, very gradual warming throughout the year, th starting in you know March and April, all the way up till August, um, peak in August um, warming. And with our flow releases in you know, this is May, uh, starting in May and June, there's this kink that occurs. So the water temperatures are warming up throughout the river. And then we release a lot of, you know, pretty cold water from Lewiston Dam and the water temperatures begin to warm up and then table, table off, taper off, they stop warming and then climb back up again a bit at the end of the summer. So there's definitely um, 
you know, you definitely see the signature of the ROB flows in the uh, temperature record, in the, you know, the with dam temperature record. Um, so this is, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle for this particular uh, graph. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, so uh, to look at the temperature results further, we ended up using RBM 10 to run a sensitivity analysis um, on the effects of temperature from different hypothetical dam release scenarios um, over the entire length of the river. So uh, we only did this for the critical rearing period, uh, which was um, from February until June. And we couldn't go any further into the year than May in drier years because uh, we, we discovered a, a tendency of RBM 10 to over predict temperatures when flows got out of the range for which it was validated. So around 350 CFS, uh, we couldn't make accurate predictions for the unimpaired. Um, and, and so all the colored lines represent a range of flows from 300 CFS to 4,000. And the dashed line represents the historic management under the rod and the solid or the, the longer dashes uh, in the line represents the unimpaired flow scenario. And you can see that the release temperatures coming out of the dam are higher than what would have been being experienced in the un unimpaired uh, after April, or sorry, or before April. But after, um, starting in May, the, the unimpaired temperatures would have been higher than the release temperatures are. And you can also see that the relative impacts of discharge get much uh, greater starting in May of dry years and um, June of normal and wetter years by the range over which those lines cover. Go, go ahead yeah. to the next slide, Seth. Go ahead, Kyle. Keep going here. I uh, have, slide hasn't changed for me yet. Uh, it has a change for everyone else? No, it's still the same. Uh, biological, biological metrics. I still have results temperature. Or, uh, yeah, sent, yeah, the longitudinal. Oh. How about now? Still the same. <laughs> still the same. All right, hang on. Well, I'll, set that out. I'll, I'll start introducing the next slide. Um, and so what we, what we did was we we took these temperatures and we tried to translate them into biological meaning, biologically meaningful metrics um, for both fish growth and then for some other uh, species in the aquatic system, including uh, flagellio legged frog, uh, tadpole development, and um, bay to day mayfly uh, generation time. So we translated these longitudinal temperatures. Uh, into metrics for each of those, one for fish growth, one for the duration of time it takes for tadpole development, and one for the duration of time that a generation of beta day mayfly takes uh, to run its course. And exactly. here, we, thanks, Seth. And here we have those metrics plotted for the unimpaired temperature scenario um, for each water year type. On top, you can see the temperatures uh, warm over this time period uh, and that the salmonid growth rates increase and um, that the time it takes for a frog to metamorphosize or a, coron a midge larva or beta day larva to uh, go through its life cycle decrease. Um, and you'll also notice that the pattern for fish growth is different than the pattern for the others. The, the largest increases for fish growth take place from February to April, uh, where for all others, the largest changes take place after April. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. Yeah, and the, you know, the 
one of the big messages here is that in colder colder years, colder water temperatures, you know, the the food that fish eat, chronomids, beta day, um, we talked a little bit about that in the first presentation, are taking longer to go through their life cycle. So they're generating fewer individuals. And right. And, and also there's certain points in the life cycle where they are more vulnerable to predation during uh, emergence, uh, for example. And so the more frequent those events happen, the more available they are as food. And hopefully you guys can see this next slide. All right. Some on a growth. Yep, I see it. OK, um, this is, you know, I think this is a really telling graph here. So the the two the dash lines that you see in each of these pan, uh, in each of the figures are the 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 range of optimal salmonic growth. So it's about 13 degrees to 16 and a half degrees Celsius or somewhere in there. That's the temperatures that that um, really optimizes fish growth under most feeding conditions, and you know, let's just look at, for example, the um, um, the Douglas City row right here, this row on top. If you notice from, um, well, let's look at the 1978 to 1999 flows here. You see most in critically dry years and then in even in normal wetter years, these lines get in the, the water temperatures um, get into this optimal growth range starting in May and June. And then similarly for the no dam, the unimpaired scenario, 2000, the no dam unimpaired scenario for 2018 to 2000, 2000 to 2018, you see these lines begin to climb up here in May and get into this band of optimal growth range. But if you look at our actual, the measured rod flows, there's this huge gap right here that uh, has occurred, that we are doing, that has occurred as a result of our flow releases. And just as our water temperatures would begin to get up into this band of opti optimal juvenile growth, we suppress it, push it down to the, to the right, as you can see. And that signature is also the same at uh, Pear Tree, uh, upstream of the North Fork Trinity. Again, if you look at the modeled kind of unimpaired scenario um, here, there's just this natural warming that occurs through April, May, June, and July, and the optimal juvenile growth uh, window, temperature window, are you know, water temperatures would be in there. But again, this middle uh, graph that you see here, there's this huge hole right here where the rod flows really press that down and press it down below the um, optimal growth range for juvenile salmonids. And it doesn't show up that much in the Trinity River at Wichipec because the rod flows have, um, during that time of year, you know, during this time of year have uh, less of an effect as they do up, upstream. Um, Kyle, you wanna take this one? Sure. Yeah, so, so here I, I had talked about how we use those um, flow scenarios over 300 CFS to 4,000 to kind of do a sensitivity analysis on the effects on temperature and frog, uh, frog uh, metamorphosis and, and mayfly and, and beta day. But here we have that temperature, um, the change in temperature from the flow, the flow scenario. So all of those, um, flows that, that between 300 and 4,000 and the historic from the unimpaired. So the straight line that across is the unimpaired and, and what's plotted is the difference. So the difference in temperature is on the left and the difference in salmonic growth is on the right. And you can see how that changes through time. Um, so greater flows in the winter months uh, and lower flows in the, in the spring lead to elevated salmonic, salmonic growth uh, because of their effects to temperature. 
And this is in part a, a function of stratification in Trinity Reservoir because stratification doesn't set up in Trinity Reservoir until around May. Uh, and right when that transition occurs is when this uh, flipping from uh, elevated flows to low flows benefiting growth uh, happens. All right. Um, this is temperature compliance at um, Douglas City, Trinity River above North Fork. And, you know, one interesting thing here is that it's, it's not entirely clear that the rod has really increased compliance, uh, maybe, uh, you know, somewhat, but um, if you look at, for example, the percent of days exceeded for the Trinity River above North Fork starting October 1st, like here, there's not a big, uh, not a big difference in the percent of days here, you know, similar for adults at, at Douglas City, some, some benefits, but um, somewhat, somewhat nominal, I would say. And then, um, in terms of the in terms of the fish growth, um, you know, there's there's uh, about similar percentage of days for the you know pre dam or sorry pre rod era and and post rod era, but more you know more of these um, colder days than that than the optimal um, juvenile growth period after the rod. Um, Kyle, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Oh, you no, know, just the, the records were limited and we didn't do any statistical analysis of the impacts um, to compliance, uh, but there were no, there were no clear patterns. This is the effect of the um, ceremonial uh, releases and um, uh, uh, fall flows to protect adult salmonid uh, releases in the Trinity River. And what you can see here from both these graphs is that the, the greatest effect, the greatest difference on temperature between either the ceremonial releases or the uh, which are on top and the um, late fall flow releases to protect adults on the bottom is that the greatest uh, difference, greatest effect is at Wichapak in the Trinity River, a uh, smaller effect at Douglas City because it's already, you know, colder up there. And then similarly, somewhat smaller effect in the actual target area in the Klamath River just because of the, the volume. Uh, of the river, but you know, with the um, with our uh, flows to protect adults on monads, we've achieved up to four degree temperature difference down uh, the Klamath uh, Klamath uh, River, um, just downstream of the Trinity River, and um, also near near the Klamath River mouth. M more on average to Two degrees to three degrees um, Celsius down there. And then this are the, um, I believe, all the observations of uh, differences in water temperature um, between the Lewiston and Trinity River at Douglas City. Paratree and Wichapec here, and then those two Klamath River sites just downstream from Trinity River and also near the Klamath River mouth. And what the one of the key takeaway messages from this graph is that, well, for one, we have models right here where we can use to that we can use to predict what the effect of a certain flow volume from. Lewiston Dam will be on downstream temperatures, but also if you see here in this bottom graph, um, 
all these data points for both the Klamath River gauges show, you know, a uh, relationship um, between um, increased flow and temperature difference until you get to right here. If you look here, 1500 CFS. After this point, 1500 CFS, all of these data points to the right, all the way over to 3000, really don't change the water temperature that much. And that was one of the key takeaway messages from this analysis is, you know, our results showed that there's, there's um, you know, uh, diminishing benefits to uh, river temperatures in the lower Klamath from the fall flow releases at releases uh, greater than um, uh, 1500 CFS over base flow, which would be right around 19, 1950. Um, you know, in terms of the lateral thermal diversity, there's, um, you know, as you can see here, this is a uh, pre-project Trinity River uh, main stem at uh, Oregon Gulch, right, Cal? Oregon Gulch. Yeah. And, and you can see here that there's really no, you know, not a, a big difference um, throughout the day in the pre-project um, uh, channel form because it's very uniform and it's all kind of one one thing. But in the design in the design flow, you get in, in the design uh, in this habitat design at um, these flows, you you start to get a lot of different areas where there's thermal diversity as the river spreads out and depths and flow and velocities um, change throughout the you know, restored channel and some onids can take advantage of that and go in and out of these different areas, feed and choose uh, water temperatures that get them into that band of optimal growth, which they do naturally because, you know, they want to grow eat as much as they can and grow as fast as they can. Yeah, and just to add, Seth, one of the things uh, that that during this report that became apparent is almost all of our temperature monitoring and most of the modeling is focused on the longitudinal and seasonal aspects of temperature and the the thermal diversity on local scales is something that we don't often uh, measure or model. And so th this was an attempt to use a tool that was available to us, which was SRH 2D temp to um, get at some of the diversity that um, is or isn't occurring in different uh, restored states. And we hope that this is incorporated into the design process in the, in the future. And, and also there's a, a current effort uh, to investigate pool stratification, another form of local temperature diversity that that isn't discussed in the paper, but it's one of these um, attempts that the program is making to better understand uh, thermal diversity on a on the both the, the on the uh, smaller uh, spatial scales rather than through um, the longitudinal aspect of the river. Um, this is just a graphic showing all of the uh, reservoir storage data from uh, 1963 to uh, to the present, and um, this lowest data point you see here, 222,000 uh, 2, acre feet, is 1977. These are the early 90s, and these really low. Uh, storage levels here were in the recent past, so 2013 and 14. Um, this is uh, water, water temperature at the uh, main outlet uh, depth right here. So water temperature on the uh, y-axis and then storage here. And on this right graph is the same, but at the outlet works, which is uh, at, a, at a lower, draws from a lower level in the reservoir. And 
you know, I think one of the key uh, takeaway messages from um, this analysis is that if you look at the, you know, at the data points and then with the uh, trend lines here, really at, at reservoir storages greater than, um, you know, about uh, 1.2 million acre feet or so, there's really not a real relationship between at the main outlet works between release temperature and storage. So the, and this is uh, end of September. So, um, you know, whether or not you end at 1.8 million acre feet at end of September or 1.2 million acre feet at end of September, it doesn't really change the uh, temperature of the main outlet that much, but it storage is less than about 1.2 million acre feet, and definitely about 1 million acre feet. Uh, the main outlet work starts to entrain, you know, warmer, warmer water, and there's mixing that's occurring down there, and that results in warmer releases to the Trinity River. And as you can see here in 2014 and 15, um, the water temperature at the main outlet works you know, was substantially greater um, than, uh, than in, in other years. Um, the auxiliary outlet works, it's been pretty consistent, but, you know, those, you can see the signature here from 2015 kind of starting to show up where even at the auxiliary outlet works, when you're getting down there at storages of and a September storage is of you know 500,000 acre feet in that area, which you know heaven forbid we get there again, but there's you know there's a chance, and um, I guess moving forward in the future, there's probably a probability that we will get there. Even at the auxiliary outlet works, that um, water temperature begins to be impacted by those low storage levels. Um, this is a, a similar graphic, but just shows each each month for the water temperature at the at the main outlet works, and um, you know as you can see here, even September, even October, November, you know at really low storages, the uh, water temperature at the main outlet works. Um, is impacted by by low uh, reservoir um, storage, and you know we we tend to forget that there's this carryover of that into October and November, and even November in here. And what we've seen, even like in this year, is that the water temperature water is actually in the in years like those is actually cooling after it leaves uh lewiston dam because it's there's this kind of carryover effect from uh the reservoir of the the thermal mass of the reservoir leaving the water warm and that's kind of it's giving the opposite signature to you know what fish would normally expect you know they would expect that as they swim upstream or I don't know if expect is the right word, but you know what I mean. The program, as they would swim upstream, water temperatures would get colder. So, you know, I think this is a um, issue that hasn't really been um, examined that well, but uh, is an effect of the Trinity River Division that um, needs some more analysis. Um, in terms of climate change, um, you know, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with the Oh, and I know we got I got to get cracking here so you guys can ask me questions. Um, you know, there's just going to be a lot less snowpack, less uh, snow um, to store, you know, let, less snow to be used as a reservoir. And, you know, it's kind of a double whammy because then you also have, if we have that same amount of precipitation falling as rain, you have flood control issues that occur that are occurring and Trinity Reservoir not being able to actually store, uh, I, you know, you can imagine, let's say Trinity Reservoir is 
almost full or nearly full and we have a large snowpack that can be metered out through the spring and the summer as it was historically. If you have hardly any snowpack and you still have Trinity Reservoir as full as it can go, there's basically less uh, yield overall that can be stored, less basin yield that can be stored. So it's kind of a double whammy in terms of um, climate change there. And um, uh, we'll just zip through the rest of this stuff. Um, yeah, and this is uh, this is actually supposed to be supposed to say the Trinity River here, but for the for the Trinity River, it's you know predicted that um, maximum street temperatures will be warmer by almost a degree, uh, two degrees under the reduced emission scenario, and um, and almost three point three degree up to three point three degrees under a high emission scenario. Um, some of our major findings, you know, rod flows have reduced spring temperatures to be less than pre-dam and less than the pre-rod flow scenarios, which affect biological processes, including fish growth, uh, insect regeneration time. Um, you know, flows and temperatures from Lewis and Dam can't be managed separately. That's, you know, a major finding. Um, it force or it's a major issue. It forces rod flows to be colder than optimal for spring rearing and um, cold water pool really um, cannot be maximized. If you, you know, if you had a temperature control device, you could, you could do that. Um, Trinity Reservoir temperatures do appear to be warming as we showed and um, meeting temperature objectives in the fall for returning adult salmon is, is going to become more challenging in the future without infrastructure changes, without a, uh, a TCD, temperature control device. So um, we really need to monitor temperatures upstream of the lake to get a full picture there. Um, we really all should be advocating or studying the, the possibility and the need for temperature control device. Um, you know, the, the, I didn't talk about this too much, but meeting those smolt targets down in Wichipec has effects upstream in terms of fish growth. So we really need to um, kind of re-examine that. And uh, we really need some uh, infrastructure improvements um, to Trinity Reservoir and to Lewiston Dam and ability to vary our dam releases at two hour intervals without impacting infrastructure we've seen in the past. Um, we really think there should be an end of September storage of at least three quarters million acre feet. It's currently 600,000 acre feet now and potentially higher. Um, and uh, multi-year drought assessment. And then the other thing that would really be useful is to have the ability to predict the effect of flows uh, particularly on stratification for going less than 350 CFS in the summer. That would give us a lot more flexibility and potentially be beneficial to uh, rearing salmonids. Um, just a couple things. We're not saying that there's water temperatures are always too cold, nor that less water is needed for the Trinity. But um, in the spring, the current release schedule is that flows are too cold for optimal fish growth. And um, we're currently limited in our management options. So we need a more nuanced approach for that. And I'd just like to thank um, all the folks here that contributed data and information. And with that, I take questions. Sorry, I didn't leave us very much time. I think that was your master plan, Seth, right? I, I somehow worked out that way. I really didn't need it to, it, need it to be that way, but. All right, if uh, anyone has any questions, uh, Go ahead and raise your hand or we've only got a few minutes, a couple minutes, so. Oh, come on, one question. Kyle and Eli and uh, others, Todd, Dave, we must have done a good job that we just explained it per everything perfectly. Well, I, I just want to thank Seth that this report has a lot of information in it and it's not all easily tied together in a clear, um, concise storyline. So thanks for 
thanks for getting it out there, Seth, and presenting to everybody. And I hope people will find that this is a really useful compilation of the, all the temperature data in the basin because uh, it took a lot of effort to get that together. And Eli did a great job. And uh, yeah. no, no one should have to do that again for a while. Hey, you know, in the last second, Seth, you know, one thing. Oh, too late. Offer's over. No, just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> it could, well, it could be. I think I'm going down. Well, I got a shake. So, you know, you're, we've been seeing these in your, your presentation showed that the, the warm water, like maybe in, in the fall period. So what is your best management strategy right now for reclamation to take to uh, make sure that the water is cold enough in the fall? Start, start the process for planning for a temperature control device. I mean, there's really not, you know, I mean, our hands are really tied without a more nuanced way to release water. And I mean, we, I don't know if this infrastructure bill can be leveraged for that. I and mean, I, mean, I mean, I know there was talk of that, but I mean, we really need to get, you know, we've got infrastructure here that's 60 years old. I mean, we got to get this, you know, into the, the 21st century here. That would be what I would say. I mean, other than that, really bad. I mean, higher, you can have higher end of September carryover. I mean, that, that is certainly one management action we recommend. That, that's, that yeah, can. so that's what I'm thinking. And I don't know how, I mean, they got to have colder water for those adults that have eggs and stuff. It seems. Yeah, I mean, they're going to be able, you know, if they have to rely on the auxiliary outlet more, then it's just generating less power also. So, you know. Yeah. Um, there's, yeah. there's a reclamation report from 2012 that suggests moving the minimum pool to, to three quarters of a million. And, and so the, the easiest thing would be to adopt the recommendations in the 2012 yep. report. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, and that's what Seth said here, you know, a quarter, three quarter million acre feet. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. It's three. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. It's three o'clock and that's all the time we have for today. We'll meet again. Uh, I think it's next Tuesday. Um, let me check real quick. Yeah, next Tuesday, the 7th at 1 p.m. for Physical Habitat. So we will see everyone next week. Thanks a lot, Seth and Kyle. And Bye.